Last time on the rise and fall of Twin Hills. Blind man sat by the road and he cried. All you gotta do is order Jesus, Grant. That's what I did. And then I got a big fat bowl of Chinese noodles on the side. Twin Hills Community Church. Oh boy. Yeah, a circus of nonsense. Morning break. Morning shakes, Molly's crying. Like the inventor of Turkish delight, C.S. Lewis once said, one fails forward toward success. And my friends, I have failed far. I'm sitting in my well-appointed office. The large picture windows look out over a sea of green grass, a glittering pond, and a verdant cluster of maples. Several Thomas Kincaid originals line the walls, including Misty Bridge with Rainbow and Misty Pond with Bridge. On my desk, my favorite Montblanc pen lays beside a picture of a toothy blonde, my wife, Tabitha, taken on our wedding day. And it's here, in my writer's haven, that I finally have the time to reflect on my journey of the past year. A journey that, dear listener, I have only now had time to unpack, as the constant demands of fatherhood and being a highly sought-after food writer afford me time for little else. Yes, listener, it's a stark departure from when you last left me. But like Jesus said to God on the cross, hold my drink. This is the rise and fall of Twin Hills. Sure there are reasons to question your process. Some outsiders do and to be perfectly, perfectly honest. We know they're all after some dirt or division. A story that tells of compromising positions. The same lie that you hide behind the pressure cooker. From the moment I laid eyes upon him, I knew Steve Judson was more than I had bargained for. He was a force, emanating an effortless charisma as he leaned in the door of my hospital room, deftly palming a quarter like a street tough in a musical or a cool referee. My feeling was one of awe. And ow, I was in bad shape. If you recall, my body and soul had been heretofore abused in the pursuit of truth. Over the course of several long days, I had gone from an unassuming food blogger in a church food court to an embattled independent journalist to what now I could only describe as Colin from the Secret Garden. You know, a sniveling little hungover weenie in a bed. My marriage had exploded, as well as my ankle and my butt, first from a burrito bowl and then from the very same burrito bowl. And my mind, while technically functioning, was adrift on a sea of confusion and dismay. How had Steve Judson, a spiritual giant, managed to elude me at every turn? It might have been because I never really tried to find him. But despite that, I had amassed a treasure trove of scandal and impropriety that had made Hobby Lobby's Iraqi art looting look like a cakewalk. If you didn't know, in 2017, Christian Craft Junkyard Hobby Lobby was ordered to pay over $3 million for its role in smuggling precious early church artifacts from the National Museum of Iraq. But rather than boycotting this unethical pillage, it was largely ignored, as conservative Christians flocked instead to more pressing crusades, such as fighting with minimum wage workers in Target for having rainbows on t-shirts or shooting Bud Light cans with AR-15s. As far as I could tell, the culture war had nothing to do with preserving actual culture. 
but so far, nothing had managed to pierce the reputational body armor of Steve. And then, Steve had appeared in my hospital room. Hey there, Grant. How you doing? Like an angel, or something less terrifying, with way fewer eyes and heads. Before this podcast, I never knew that angels, as described in the Bible, are utterly the stuff of nightmares. Seriously, look it up. But now, the nightmare of Steve seemed to break, and here in its place, the tanned, smiling face of the man who I had been looking for, and he seemed like he had been waiting for me. I'm not trying to say anything about your profession, but I honestly think that some of them are afraid to talk to the real thing. At my request for an interview, Steve had sprung to action, ordering two wingback chairs, a small table with water, and a potent cocktail of antibiotics to stave off my illness despite my doctor's warnings. I do got to tell you, I think you probably have mad rat disease. And now, here I was, sitting across from Steve, formally, with only the hospital gown and weeping rat bite giving hint that anything was amiss. We began to talk. I just want to ask, like, um, what the fuck happened over the last, I don't know, like, couple days or whatever? I tell you, there are times when I wonder if it happened at all. I felt much the same. It, to me, is a painterly succession of images now, and not so much a linear story, or whatever linear means to you. To me, linear meant the order in which things had happened to me and why. But Steve, like Jesus when he was in Christ mode, wasn't going to answer my questions simply. It's, just, it's a bit like walking through a gallery, a very beautiful, very beautiful gallery, but it's deserted. An apt metaphor, since I was currently living alone in a Honda Odyssey. And in some of the rooms, there are no paintings or photos or statues. And in some of the rooms are crowded with junk. And paintings, let's say, but they're turned the wrong way. And the backs of the paintings are the only part you could see. My life did resemble a depressing museum, like the National Museum of Iraq when Hobby Lobby stole all the art and probably replaced it with a bunch of scrapbooking supplies. That to me is an obscure place to me because I found, and I feel strongly about this, that tomorrow is the most important day of my life. And more and most importantly, it's, it's the most important day of yours the day after the day you talked to me. I had no idea what the hell Steve was talking about. The dulcet timber of his baritone voice washing me with words and images that when considered even for a moment make no fucking sense. Yes, it was clear. This man was truly a gifted pastor. Because now you'll know, you'll be equipped, you'll have met me, you'll have encountered me and all the decisions after that are up to you i can't tell you what to write or who to write it for or where you're going to put it or what you're even going to do with it but your decisions are much more important than you may know i had heard words like this before in a different life i had attended woodstock 99 during a particularly inspired set by anaheim supergroup buck cherry i scaled a porta potty in order to get a better view your decisions are much more important than you may know the very words spoken to me from stage by Buck Cherry lead singer Josh Todd. Your decisions are much more important than you may know. One, two, three, four. Just before I jumped from the latrine roof into the mosh pit and straight onto the head of my first wife, who, incidentally, never forgave me for her ongoing neck issues. But after telling all this to Steve, I could tell I was losing him. I began to delve into his past. So, uh, what was your childhood like? Oh, I could go on and on for hours. And I honestly don't think it would do anyone any good because everybody's had parents. You had parents? Uh, yeah. A mother and a father? Yeah. And siblings? Um, yeah. In a house? Yeah. Did you move around, though? You didn't live in the same house? No, I, yeah, that's right. right. Naturally. I understand. It's very isolating, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I guarantee you I, I understand what you're going through. I understand what you're talking about. You know, I think you and I, in a lot of ways, could relate about this. Because who hasn't felt that isolation? Who hasn't been that new kid at school? Who hasn't been brutalized or terrorized by, oh, I don't know, police or police or 
parents or parent, brother, whatever the name is, Michael. Or how, how did you know that? Well, I, enough about me. I felt like Steve could see me, like he had known me for my entire life. I was warming to him, but I knew that I couldn't let my defenses down. My journalistic afterburner kicking in, I began peppering Steve with hard-hitting questions about his trail of sins. And I was relentless. So could you tell me about Doug Jeffers and if you pushed him out of the... I only wish that Doug were still with us. It breaks my heart to think of the way he turned from the church. Doug is only human, and I won't let you say... And I won't sit still for you calling him a coward, for you saying, or for anyone for that matter, saying that Doug abandoned us. I know he regrets it. And I forgive him. And uh, what about the secretary stuff? I suppose you'd like to take a woman who gives all of her time and all of her effort and selflessly gives herself to the administration of a wonderful church and community. And you'd like to, to look into her life and press her on her personal details. Well, I'm not going to help you with that, but I will tell you, she's generously given her time, her soul, her spirit, her body, time and time again to me and others. She's given it all, every drop. Did your wife beat up a boat salesman? Yes and no. Did you go to Mr. Buck Gay Club? Certainly not. The thrill of reporting was rushing back as I battered Steve with each incisive question. The... The... Yes, yes, and what? He was cornered, agitated, as I pushed him harder and harder. Uh, the, 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 the... the you stealing the... the em stealing. Embryo? The... Firing... Firing Dana? Certainly you enjoy gossip and rumors and innuendo. Your question? It, is it true? What is truth? Jesting pilot asked and did not stay for an answer. How dare you? How dare you presume to know a truth when you know? You've listened. You've read. You know the word and you know the scripture. You know that the truth lies with God. The truth is is exclusively the property of God, of Jesus, his son. You have no access to it, but through him. How dare you? But I was wrong. Steve was a master, twisting around each accusation like Chubby Checker in a high school production of The Crucible. And what started as an inquisition of this man and his scandals was quickly becoming a referendum on me. You've been living a lot the whole thing. Well, I, I, Think about that. It's better to tell the truth, isn't it? You don't have any fans. You don't have any readers. You don't have any of those things. And they don't matter. Steve stood, pacing behind me like a tiger stalking a German magician. You've got to build yourself back up again, and you know that the stone that was rejected by the builders was used first to rebuild the temple? You rebuild your temple with the master builder, with Jesus. Build yourself back up. Forget the lies, forget the phony career and the fake success. He was right. What had started as an innocent midlife crisis had quickly boiled into a bitter soup of personal loss, self-delusion, and bodily harm. Had I really been living a lie this whole time? And by whole time, I meant my entire life. I felt like a liar and a hypocrite. You're not a liar. You're not a hypocrite. That's not you. Come to the truth and walk in the truth with God. And let the truth set you free. But little did I know that the truth, like the contents of a hot dog, was more surprising than I ever imagined. When we come back. Steve and I had now been talking for an hour, and I had all but abandoned my interview. Later, I would realize that his tactics were much like the enhanced interrogation methods used by law enforcement. The building of rapport, an emotional appeal to my past, the simultaneous stroking and assailing of my ego. 
in the promise that, with my cooperation, there would be an opportunity of redemption. It all reminded me of the tactics an FBI agent had used on me in the basement of an old shoe factory for my participation in the Occupy Wall Street movement. In fact, I hadn't participated, but rather had been playing hacky sack next to a sign that said, banks are bad, and been rounded up. The result, two years of supervised probation and a permanent place on the do not fly list. But that is another story. This story was all Steve's. Would you like to hear a true story yeah. about a shepherd who had charge of 100 sheep? 100? And though almost all of them, 99 of them, stayed within the fold, the shepherd left the fold to find and hundredth of them, just the one. The other 99 perished. And when the shepherd came back with the one he found, his employer was upset. He said, you've left 99 dead sheep on the plane. He said, but I found the one that was lost. I was lost, lost in my life, and sort of lost as to what the hell Steve was ever talking about. Am I the sheep? The sheep. The Shep. Shep. The singular sheep is Shep. And you're the shepherd in this scenario? Only God is the shepherd. Okay. God. What even was she? The best I could come up with was a beautiful black woman on a holographic horse, only to realize that was the cover of Beyonce's Renaissance album. But sitting here with Steve, I began to consider the journey I had taken and the sacrifices I had made. Despite my trials, I had never turned my back on God, probably because I didn't believe in God. But I had also never blamed him, which I thought should count for something. If there was one constant, it was my burning desire, not for truth, but to feel important. And was asking to feel important too much to ask? I didn't think so. True, everyone has a need to be seen, but I needed more. I needed to think my opinions, words, and actions meant something. I wanted people to know my name and give me discounts. I wanted to be talked about when I wasn't there, and when I walked in a room, have people say things like, oh, it's that one guy. I wanted great acclaim and no responsibilities. I wanted options and esteem, and a wife who told me I was great despite any shortcomings. That's all I wanted, which is exactly what I said to Steve. Well, do good for yourself now before it's too late. Something strange was happening, my face twisting into an odd upside down smile as a clear salty discharge leaked from my eyes. How? Pray. I don't know how. Say thank you. Say thank you. It's a form of prayer. When God gave Job his troubles, Job thanked the Lord. Thank you. Thank you for making me broke. Thank you for making me broke. Thank you for taking my food block. Thank you for taking my food block. Thank you for turning my wife against me. Thank you for turning my wife against me. You humiliated me and took my identity and my money and my pride in that parking lot in Cleveland. How'd you know that? I listened to your podcast. Oh. Thank the Thank Lord. You. Thank the Lord the way Job thanked the Lord. Thank you for my troubles. Thank you for my troubles. My misery. My misery. My grief. My grief. Thank you for leaving my little brother at the bottom of the frozen Thank pie. you for leaving my little brother. I didn't do that. Uh, there was a different guy. Say thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Steve. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. But my emotional walls weren't the only ones to come down. As Steve stood over me, a look of fatherly knowing crossed his face as I lay prostrate on the floor beneath him. He patted my head like a shepherd with his lamb. 
It was then that Steve leaned over and whispered in my ear. Are you ready? I nodded, knowing that whatever was next would certainly be better than what was behind. Steve helped me to my unsteady feet, then turned, faced the security camera on the wall, and pronounced, People of God, let us give thanks and welcome Grant, for he has come home. And as the walls of the hospital room fell away, I realized I was standing next to Steve on the stage of Twin Hills Community Church. Brothers and sisters, let us give thanks to God for the one that was lost has been found. I stared out at the several thousand smiling faces in the auditorium of Twin Hills Church, then up to the jumbo screen where my own dumbstruck face stared back. In the front row, the phantoms of episodes passed. Doug Jeffers, Meryl Miller, Darren Gold, Buddy Champion, Dana Dumzit, Pam Avenatti, Larry Super, Dr. Dean, all gazing up, smiling, clapping. Had I died? I thought perhaps I had and that the events of the past several days had been nothing more than a psychedelic hell realm I had only seen twice before when experimenting with DMT, once at a Buck Cherry concert and the other time at Occupy Wall Street. But no, this was very real. The reality slowly dawning that this whole journey had always been for and about me. But how had Steve done it? How had he managed to turn the tables, like Jesus in the temple, and still managed to keep all the coins? The answer, I'm afraid, was there all along. I thought back to my first time in the Twin Hills food court, where an eager Doug Jeffers had begun talking to me. People don't want to ask for help. What do you need? He had lit the fires of my curiosity, like the flames in Walk With Jesus Asian Cafe. Hello, it's Meryl Miller. And Meryl, Steve's long-suffering secretary, had called me for an interview, one that I hadn't requested, a detail I forgot to mention. I'm calling because you should interview me since I have a lot of things to say about Steve Jetson. The same had been true for the gay youth pastor, Darren, and Pam, the lawyer. Dana Dumsett had approached me at the Barnes & Noble. At first, I thought she was hitting on me, but magically just wanted to talk about Steve. Ooh, I like those shoes. Do you want to talk about how Steve Johnson stole my baby? And when I wanted to think by the water on the day my wife left me, a series of hand-painted detour signs had deposited me at Champion's boat lot. Steve didn't try to kill me. He tried to save me. His whole life he tried to save me. And when I fell off the wagon, Larry Super, Steve's double, had picked me up. Hey there, uh, yeah, you need a ride? and dropped me at what I thought was a hospital, only to learn later that it was in fact the loading dock of the Twin Hills Auditorium, where Dr. Dean had examined me. Notice any lumps or anything down here? But clearly, he knew nothing about medicine. The blood rushed forward and sperm launched, swooshed up into her guts. A doctor who had tested me in the same way that the devil tested Job. I just want you to say, Steve, Jesus, the Bible, the church, is all nonsense. What do you say? And when I had refused, Steve had appeared. Clearly, all of this had been for me. But why? And why had Steve gone so far as to expose his own dirty laundry in the process? The answer, it turned out, was simple. The growing scandal surrounding celebrity pastor Carl Lentz. The pastor of one of the biggest evangelical churches in the country has abruptly stepped down. Long, now vowing to battle lawsuits from five additional accusers, took the stand Tuesday claiming inappropriate behavior that shows the close relationship between evangelist power couple and their pool boy. He passes gas in his own church. Seeing the growing number of scandals that had unseated many of his contemporaries, like Mark Driscoll, Bill Hybels, Carl Lentz, and about a hundred other unremarkable white guys, Steve had gotten worried. So he decided to take a proactive approach. Yes, there were problematic things in his past, but rather than try to hide them, 
Steve pivoted, letting his missteps be exposed in the least important and impactful way possible, a food blog and a podcast. And not only that, he had handed that responsibility to me, a non-believer, who instead of taking him down, had run straight into his arms and the arms of Christ. Steve, it turned out, was teaching Twin Hills the most important lesson, that all of us are guilty of sin, even him, but that that sin, that mark we carry for being born, is ultimately overshadowed by the victory of winning even one person to Jesus, and that person was me. And for the members of Twin Hills who had been listening to the podcast, Steve had not only shown us that he was just like us, mortal, sinful, needing of the grace of God, but had snatched a poor soul from the jaws of hell in the process. And now, washed in the blood, I could see that Steve was in the blood shower next to me, scrubbing my back, exfoliating my past, so that I could finally come home. And not only that, folks, I want you to know that we are making a full-time position for this man, head food critic of ohmygod.com.twinhills.org. Read it, cherish it, because this man is special. And at this home, I was important. Put your hands together, folks. Wasn't that great? Love Bob. Picture this. I'm sitting in a beautiful food court. The burbling fountains and manicured ficus remind me of the Garden of Gethsemane, or Eden, before Eve ruined it. My assistant, Shasta, smiles, waiting for me to take a bite of a donut and give her my thoughts and opinions about it so that she can write them down for my popular food blog. For a taste of heaven, make sure to try Holy's, the newest donut hole bakery at Twin Hills. Five stars, by the way. They're delicious, unique, and the perfect reminder that only Jesus can fill the hole in the donut that is your heart. There are days when I think back about my time before Twin Hills, before Jesus, and before Steve. But the more I think with my head, the more I am convinced that thinking really is the whole problem with our world. For is it not thinking that makes us so sad, so filled with doubt that we aren't enough? And when we doubt, we blame. And when we blame, we accuse. But the truth, however, is immune. It's smooth and strong and impervious to libel. The truth is what you say it is. And although it has been said time and time again, it is worth remembering. You can come at the truth with accusations, but the accusations won't stick. But don't worry, the accusations won't stick. Okay, folks, that was the season finale of The Rise and Fall of Twin Hills. The Rise and Fall of Twin Hills was created by Mega the Podcast and written by Greg Hess, with Steve being improvised by none other than Kevin Dorff. The theme song was written and performed by Joel Hansen, and the series was edited by Hannah Parsons. Hey, you can help us continue putting out great stuff like this by supporting our Patreon, using our sponsors, or subscribing to an ad-free feed. I know you probably hear it a lot from other podcasts and also from us, but if we could get one out of every five people who listen to Mega just to support it in some way, it really could give us the latitude to do more new, interesting projects like this one. So please think about joining up. All those links are in the show notes. Thanks to our wonderful guests and see you next time with a brand new Mega. Mega.